And then I um, would like to say thanks again to the conference organizers. I'm really glad we were able to hold this meeting um, virtually. And I've been getting a lot out of hearing everyone's great presentations. And so I'm happy to be talking to you today about more fun things about secondary creators. And this will relate to a lot of um, the previous presentations and questions that have been brought up. Um, and I started this work as a postdoc on LROC some time ago, and we finally have collected all of the results and now have an accepted paper at GGR. And so there's a lot of information and I won't be able to cover all of it. So if you're curious about more, please check out our paper. And um, the work I'm going to be presenting today is mostly for the moon. And my co-conspirators on that project were um, Brad and Bill. And then since then, we've been fortunate enough to receive some additional funding to continue this work. And we've had a lot of other awesome people join our team, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. And since some of the, these people are on the call today, I welcome you to join in the discussion. Uh, we are interested in things, um, but one of them is the size and spatial distribution of secondary craters. Um, we are also interested in the impact process and using secondary craters to get back at what happened during the impact, uh, particularly for fragmentation and ejection of material. We have some larger comparative, planetar comparative planetology goals, one of them being looking at if we can see any effects from the target material of the primary impactor. And um, I did some work on both Europa and Ganymede as a graduate student for a very similar type of study. And so now we're able to compare that to the results from the moon. And it turns out that Europa and Ganymede have very similar gravities to the moon. So, and the, the world of the many parameters um, that go into uh, how impacts occur, that is one variable that is controlled in this particular situation. Um, and then, uh, but gravity is always there. <laughs> and uh, so we'd also like to look at the effect of gravity. And so our continued work is going to be comparing um, the types of results you'll see today for to similar results on Mercury. There are two main about One is the secondary craters themselves. And the other is um, deriving information about the ejective fragments that form those secondaries. And I'll just let these um, pop up here. We touch on a lot of different applications in the, the couple of papers we have on this topic. Um, and I won't be able to discuss everything here, but I'll hit the highlights and happy to discuss more today or, or in the future with anyone who's interested. So for this first part on secondary craters, I'll give you a little overview of the, what we mapped and how we mapped it. For this study, we looked at six, dif uh, six different primaries and the secondary fields around them. And we were really interested in getting a range of primary sizes. So we looked at Orient Hall, which you can see here in the upper left. We have some more mid-sized for, for our study um, craters, and then some smaller craters here, um, which we were fortunately able to do due to the very high resolution L rock max. And um, just like Cassie was showing, I'll, I'll have some lovely pictures from those of secondary craters. Um, and so our smallest crater was about 800 meters in size. That's the size of the primary. Um, and we weren't sure how small of secondaries we would find, but at least down to this smallest size that we've studied so far, we, we still find some. Uh, so many of you are familiar with the moon and with secondary craters, but this is just a little animation um, my intern this summer, Michaela Hoffman, put together, zooming around the quick map. Um, and really high resolution images, but this gives you a, a view of the kind of details you can see. Um, and because these are so high resolution, we we're able to see even thinner deposits and small features like um, the V-shaped ejecta that you'll see uh, occurring around some of these secondaries. And as a reminder, some of the, the very largest secondaries, those are the ones that would be close to the primary, um, typically. Those are usually about 5% of the diameter of the primary. So that gives you an idea of the, the scale we're looking at. There's a variety of fun morphologies that we look for for these secondary craters. As I mentioned, there's often this V-shaped ejecta, although that is a thinner deposit that can be um, erased over time. 
Um, we are mostly looking at fresh, or we should say relatively well-preserved in the case of Oriental um, secondary fields. And there's also a common occurrence of a splatty downrange rim. So this is the side that's farther away from the primary and it gives them kind of a, a little bit of an asymmetrical shape. And as many of you are familiar, they often occur in chains, clusters, and can be found in bright rays. So this is a good time to mention that we are um, not by any means trying to map every secondary crater, uh, partly because that's simply not possible, <laughs> and um, partly because of the objectives of our study. Um, we are focusing on mapping both the largest, but also as many smaller secondaries as we can. Um, but we think we can get a, a little bit more complete sample of the largest ones at any given distance from a primary crater. And also we are interested in um, secondaries that could have plausibly have been formed by the impact of a, not, not necessarily completely intact, but a mostly intact fragment or a very tight cluster of fragments that were ejected from the primary. And that's because of our interest in studying the ejecta fragments themselves. So in a lot of ways, this is very different than a lot of studies that map primary craters. And so we, we take a lot of steps to try to mitigate. Um, I'm sure a few primary craters have snuck into our data set, uh, but we really try to limit how many there are with our mapping methods. Um, and just here's some lovely pictures, again, of different secondary craters. There's a pretty broad range in scale here. Um, from these guys in the upper left, which I'm pretty sure are from Kepler. And then we have some, uh, this is from Tycho actually here in the middle, and some of the smaller secondaries around some of the smaller primaries that you see here. And then some from Oriental here on the lower right. Um, and each secondary field is unique. They all have their own interesting characteristics, their um, and that's actually led us to have an interest in studying secondary morphologies themselves. And also the ejecta of secondary craters can be pretty interesting as well as, as you see. Yes, and uh, <laughs> Michelle sent me a note about primary contamination. And that's totally true. We, um, we don't want any of those primaries contaminating our data set. We'll take all your secondaries and you can have all of our primaries. <laughs> So in every case, um, we looked around the, the, the field of secondary craters. Um, we, as I said, each one is a little different. So there's, you know, different constraints, like say there's another crater nearby. We often don't map that direction, things like that. But in general, we consider tens of thousands of features overall. And we have a, a confidence criteria that we apply when we're mapping. And it's basically based on how many of those expected morphological characteristics there are. Um, for a secondary crater. And then we only retained the very highest confidence ones for the upcoming analysis. All right, so diving into the results. Um, I'm going to use Copernicus here as an example. Um, this particular set of craters that we studied, it has the most, the highest number of secondaries that were high confidence. And this is for a couple reasons. One, Copernicus is relatively young um, and relatively large and also conveniently formed on Mare, which makes it easier for us to find and follow these secondary craters. So this is an example of plotting the size of the secondary crater here on the y-axis um, versus its distance from Copernicus. So here's Copernicus at the origin of this plot approximately to scale. And um, then you can see at any given distance here, there's some largest, if I can get my mouse back, some largest size and then many, many, many smaller ones. This lower bound is simply a cutoff um, due to the image resolution, and it's not a, a physically meaningful cutoff. However, the upper bound is, um, and we, that's what we decided we would like to characterize. And that's what these uh, lines are showing you here. Um, and we used quantile regression to fit a power law. And in this case, we did two different quantiles we did the um, 99th, which kind of represents a more typical maximum secondary size. And then in this case, we also did the 99.9th just to kind of edge that up and say, what is the absolute max of a secondary you might expect at this distance? Um, and I didn't put the confidence intervals on, on here, but we do have that in our, our paper as well. So you can take this kind of information and this kind of gives you a range of 
typical largest secondaries at any given distance. And you can make plots like are shown here. Um, and actually here, I do have the uh, Apollo sites marked in these red boxes. So each one of these contours is just 100 kilometers out from Copernicus. And then we're just using these um, fits to say, what are the largest secondaries you might expect at, at this distance? And so we wanted to extend this now, not just to the individual primaries that we looked at, but also to say, can we make this a function of primary crater size? Um, and so that was, that was one of the goals. Uh, and so here you see the same type of plot for all of the six secondary fields. And if you look at the red points and the, the solid dark line here, um, that's the 99th quantile fit in each of these cases. Um, there's a couple things you can see. And uh, one of them is that this, this uh, distribution and the slope of the upper envelope um, changes as you go from larger craters over here all the way down to Kepler and then to even our smallest crater in the lower right here. And this slope gets a lot flatter. So by the time you get to these small craters, um, the size of the largest secondary is almost not changing as you move out. Um, and we've scaled these by various physically meaning parameters. Well, in the case of the secondaries, we scaled by the, the size of the primary. Um, and we've done a lot of tests and it looks like this is a, a real scale dependence that we're finding. So then we also took this, this is just another way of doing that. Here is the exponent um, on these fits and it's just plotted as a function of crater, primary crater diameter. And so you can see this, this trend again. And so there's, you know, it's not necessarily a tightly clustered line. There's some big error bars, but there's definitely a general trend for having um, higher, steeper distributions for larger craters. And so what we, again, what we've done is try to make this, I heard your alarm, um, a function of two different things, both the distance from the primary crater and the, the function of the size of the primary crater. And so then you get a plot like this. Here we have the primary crater on the x-axis and the distance from it on the y-axis. And then each of these contours represent the size of a secondary crater that would be expected. These two little black dots just show you that um, it's not a unique solution. You could have, for example, a one kilometer secondary farther from a larger primary or closer to a smaller primary. Um, but it's just another useful piece of information if you wanna try and think about what are the largest secondaries in your study area from um, a given set of primary craters, or if you're trying to determine the origin of say a cluster of secondary craters. And as, as I showed before, there's, there's definitely work to refine this. Um, and that's part of what we're doing in our second, third, whatever phase of the project we're in. Okay, so in my final couple of minutes, I'm gonna talk about the ejecta fragments. And we have a ton of results about the ejecta fragments in, in the paper, but I'll just do it briefly here. Um, we have two things that we measured, as I mentioned. And then we derive two things about the fragments that created each secondary. And the velocity of the fragment is pretty simply from the distance of that secondary from the primary using the ballistic range equation on a sphere. And then we use both that velocity and the size of the secondary crater to estimate the size of the fragment. And scaling equations have been mentioned several times. Um, and we have tons of things that we talk about in the paper. We do a lot of parameter uh, tests and also discuss um, the feasibility of using these at small velocities. And we also do some kind of just um, checks, like looking at the uh, size of the boulders, the largest size of the boulders on the ejecta blanket, things like that. Um, and it seems like they still are working pretty well at these sizes. And there's some other experiments that indicate that these are still useful at these velocities and sizes. Okay, so quickly. This is a similar plot, but now with the ejective fragment size and the ejective fragment velocity. This our red curve is now the 99th quantile. And for reference, we've plotted the mean predicted spall diameter that comes out of spallation theory. Um, so again, we characterize all of these with the, the data itself with the power law. Um, and spallation theory also has is a power law, comes out as a power law. And this exponent for spallation theory is minus one. Um, close to minus one for most cases. And it doesn't have a dependence on the, the scale, basically. And so this is the same type of plot you saw before. 
now again, there are the ejective fragments, and we see this same uh, scale dependence change in the size of fragments as we saw for the secondaries, because this data comes from the secondaries. So I will end here with my conclusions, and basically, um, okay, secondaries, maybe they're not everywhere, um, but there are a lot of places. Uh, and we wanted to look at, could we define the largest, the expected largest size of a secondary any place on the moon? And so with this, you can take a, you know, any set of primaries that you're interested in and say, you know, anywhere on the moon, what would be the largest expected size from this set of primaries? And um, then we found this scale dependence that seems to be occurring during dynamic fragmentation. And we hope that these results can feed back into, um, I should say, both analytical and numerical modeling of fragmentation and help us better understand the impact process. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Very, quite fascinating. Are there any questions? Let's see. Yeah, it looks like there are two, at least for the moment. Um, first from Veronica Bray. I'd be interested to see if you don't see those typical secondaries within Cassie's melt regions. Perhaps later flow of the ejected melt deposits has covered secondaries in these limited regions. Yeah, good question. And I was I was kind of looking at the figures, and and Bill kind of brought this up too. Um, those particular ones that Bill asked about, I thought um, didn't look as as clear as most of the secondaries around Tycho do look. Um, and uh, I think we'd have to go back and check is the answer. Um, but that would be a fun thing to, to check about to see if we can see anything about the timing. I'm gonna write it down before I forget. Okay. Uh, I'll give you five seconds to write that before no, I go No, it's the next okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, David Minton asked, for the big secondaries like from Oriental, do you see tertiaries? Oh, I'm so glad you asked about tertiaries. Um, I actually have a, a student this summer who was on a hunt for tertiaries. And um, we, we haven't concluded our search, but I will tell you what we've concluded so far is that um, there is very, you need really young um, deposits, basically, ejecta to, to see anything. Um, so oriental, most of even the V-shaped ejection, you can still see hints of V-shaped ejection and stuff like that, but most of it is gone. Um, and interestingly, even Tycho is really not young enough for us either. Um, and that's because, it, as you know, the, the thinner, smaller things um, go more. Um, since you asked, I will show one fun thing if I can. Um, I might have to reshare. I can't remember if I shared my screen or the whole thing. We were not expecting to, here I can share my screen. Um, we were not expecting to find um, tertiary necessarily around smaller um, secondaries, around smaller primaries, just because we thought there wouldn't be enough, you know, oomph. Um, but uh, this was just a, such a cool thing that my intern found this summer. I thought I would show it off real quick. So here's a very small primary. I think it's, it's about, well, we call it 1p8. So it's 1.8. Um, kilometers in diameter, and there might be a delay. So hold on a sec here, you can see the, the primary. Um, and then he was mapping secondary around this, this uh, primary, and she found one that have these really interesting dents. Zoom in so it renders faster. There we go. And we haven't necessarily convinced ourselves that these are tertiary features yet, but um, we're investigating them. So um, you can some fun uh, secondaries here with their v-shaped ejecta and there's this relatively large one that has these boulders um, downrange and there's not a lot that have uh, boulder fields um, but then there's also these kind of elongated dents um, that have these large boulders behind them and they look very similar to you know like boulder trails like on uh, ejecta blankets um, and they are uh, pretty much radial to this this secondary crater so that's actually the, the most likely thing we've found so far, um, but we're gonna keep looking and see what we find. Very neat. Um, I've never seen that before. Uh, well, we were very surprised. We yeah. were not looking for them here and she just, she has a keen eye. What can I say? Yeah, well, and that's at the edge of NAC resolution. Um, there is a question from one of your co-authors, Bill McKinnon. He wants to know if melt blobs make their own quote unquote type 
of secondaries? Hmm. That's also a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm usually looking farther out. I mean, even though there is lots of distal melt, as you just saw, um, I'm usually looking out farther than I would think for melt, but that's a great thing to check on. I'm not sure. Okay, several notes of good points and awesome, but uh, no further questions at the moment in the chat. Oh, I see. Oh, wait. Uh, no, there's one. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Um, I'm going to butcher the name, so I'm just trying the first name. Um, Denise asks, do secondary craters cause us to make fatal mistakes when calculating age? Because, as you said, they are everywhere. Um, so lots of people have worked on how to mitigate these effects, and I won't have time to go into them all now because I know we need to go on. Um, but uh, there's lots of literature on this, so I'm sure we can bring this up in the discussion. Yeah, and I think we talked about it a little bit yesterday, too. Um, I guess, in short, there are ways to mitigate the effects. And as long as you're doing old, big stuff, you're probably good. But good discussion question. Um, and Kush asks, will the results of your great work, um, Secondary Crater Catalog, be available for other scientists? Uh, well, thank you for the compliment. Um, and kind of uh, what we've done is more give an equation where you can um, pick the primaries that you're interested in and say maybe what's the maximum size, you know, plus or minus a decent error bar um, at a given distance from that. So it's a little different than a, a catalog um, like other, what others on this call have created. And it is available, I should say, <laughs> in our, our JGR paper. Okay, so check out Kelsey's JGR paper for that. Uh, it says thank you. And again, the moment there is no further question, although uh, Bill McKinnon notes that his question I asked you uh, was more general one for the group. So something uh, perhaps for the discussion at the end of the day after Michelle's talk would be, again, could melt blobs make their own type of secondaries? <laughs> 